So to finish this off, first thing we need to do is talk about Hun's rule, or Hun, I don't know, I'm not German, so Hun's rule. Now, I'm, going, I'm not going to write this out. I'm going to say it to you, but don't get your panties in a bunch if you don't get it all down precisely, because it's going to sound like a bunch of gibberish. I kind of do that intentionally. Then I'm going to show you an example of applying Hun's rule, and it's all going to make sense. So here it is. <laughs> kind of a line from a movie. Anyway, um, Hun's rule says that. <laughs> I can't just listen to it the first time. Okay, because there's no way you're going to be able to listen and write this out. When electrons occupy orbitals of equal energy, one electron enters each orbital until all orbitals contain one electron with parallel spin. Or in other words, okay, so let's do that again. When we have orbitals of equal energy, so looking up here, does anyone see any orbitals that have equal energy? Give me some landmarks. Remember, energy. No, you don't see any. Well, let me see. There's nine. There are 30 orbitals currently present. Most, many of them have equal energy. Go ahead. A little bit, a little bit more um, landmark. You're getting close. You're getting there. Specifically, what piece? You're saying this px and this py have equal energy? Is that what you meant? Okay, what about at the second energy level? Are there any p orbitals? What can be said about their energy? Oh, they're all the same. <laughs> what about the d orbitals up here? What can you say about their energy? They're all the same. What about the p orbitals? All the same to get of the three, right? So as it turns out, there's a lot of groups of orbitals that have the same energy. Would you agree? This is when Hund's rule applies. Now, going back to that whole, were you my electron yesterday? You, I had you, okay, you were my electron yesterday. Okay. Um, so, so going back to that whole idea about electrons repelling each other. Left hand, please. Okay. And not only do they repel each other, but if they're having the same spin, they're really going to repel each other because now we've got the whole electromagnet or the uh, magnetism kind of thing going on too, right? Okay. We talked about if one of them is turned over and has opposite spin, now they can at least tolerate each other. Okay. But they're still repelling each other because they're still negatively charged. Okay. I may have made a comment to I ask you guys something about um, sharing a room with a sibling before. Okay, All right, so I'm gonna, the application of Hund's rule is going to be this. Let's imagine we're at the second energy level. And let's imagine that I have three electrons. Now let's go with six. Let's imagine I have six electrons that need to go into the second energy level, need to occupy some orbitals in the second energy level. Now remember, just like I've got drawn over here, I just kind of expanded this. Um, the s orbital is at a lower energy than the three p orbitals, but the three p orbitals are of equal energy. Would you guys agree with that? Okay. Um, Anyway, where do you think, that, and what's, what are electrons trying to do? Well, they repel each other, but what are they trying to do? Why are they, they're to the nucleus, right? Now, we've already talked about that centripetal acceleration and all that kind of stuff. They, they want to get as close to the nucleus as possible. So where is that first electron going to go, do you think? In the 2s orbital. 
by convention, we go with an arrow pointing up. What's up? What's down? Who really knows? Who really cares? But by convention, when we're doing electron configurations, you put the first uh, electron in. Now, we have a second electron that needs to go somewhere. Does it necessarily want to go here? Well, no, because there's another electron right there. They don't like each other. They're repelled by each other, right? So it could go up here. However, that's a nice little energy gap. Would you agree? So energetically speaking, in which case would it be in lower energy, uh, or, or in other words, um, be able to get as close to the nucleus as possible without being repelled as much by something else? Well, it could either come here, or it could flip over and tolerate this one. Turns out, lower, uh, um, it's going to uh, do the flip over thing and go there. It is less energy for it to do that. So far, we have put two of the six electrons in. Where is the third electron going to go? Well, this is kind of a no-brainer. Now, remember, the third energy level is way up here. Remember that little diagram I showed you where there, it showed you the spacing of the energy levels? Okay. Where's that third electron going to go? Well, one of these, because they're all of equal energy. Would you agree? Yeah. Now, again, we go back to the idea, which one's which, which? What's the X? What's the Y? What's the Z? Well, it really doesn't matter. But by convention, when we're doing this, we're going to put it in the 2PX. Okay? And so it's going to go in, and again, by convention, we put an electron it, the first electron in orbital we put with an arrow pointing up, it really doesn't matter, but that's the way we do it. The fourth electron, where is that going to go? Anyone want to take a stab? At B, an electron. Right, which requires some energy. which would require no energy, be well, because that they're all of equal energy. Would you agree? Yeah, and so that's where it's going to go. So the, and so we just applied Hund's rule. When electrons are occupying orbitals of equal energy, one electron is going to enter each of those orbitals with the same or parallel spin. Okay. So now we've got, uh, let me see, four electrons in there. Do you guys understand why I'm doing the one, two, three, four thing? So when you guys look back in your notes, you can see what we did. Okay. Um, where's the fifth electron going to go? I think you guys are starting to figure it out, right? We're going to go here. And then where is the sixth electron going to go? Flip over and go back to the... P, X. Boom. There, you guys just figured out Hun's rule. So when electrons are occupying orbitals of equal energy. Now, notice I filled this one first because there were no other orbitals of equal energy. Would you agree? But when we got up to this set, boom, 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 and then back. Now, if we had seven... Eight, and where would that ninth one have to go then? All the way up here. Okay. Hun's rule, where is that going to apply? Everywhere, except the S orbitals. Same thing applies with these, same thing applies with the S. So far, so good? Okay, we're getting closer. Lastly, the Pauli exclusion principle. Named after our old friend Wolfgang Pauli. Somebody, somebody in here needs to name one of their kids Wolfgang. You just got to do it. Great. 
It can be a middle name. That's fine. <laughs> Just don't. I actually never want to know whether you did it or not. Because I'll be done in like nine years, and that's way too early for you to be having kids. All right. Um, basically, what Wolf or the poly Wolf guy, what the poly exclusion principle says is um, no two electrons can have exactly the same set of four quantum numbers. I'll say that again. No two electrons can have exactly the same set of four quantum numbers. In other words, remember we used this analogy of an address? That means only one electron can live at an address. Let's go back to that same example. And this is really going to start tying in the whole quantum number with the symbol thing that we're doing. We had electrons here, 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 and here. Would you agree? Yeah. Okay. Just for fun, Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to determine the quantum numbers for each of these electrons. You remember the symbols for those quantum numbers are m, or sorry about that, n, l, m sub l, and m, m, eh, m sub s. All right. Just for some fun, so we can practice this. What is for this electron right here? What is the value of N? What energy level is it on? Two. What is the value of L? You may want to refer to your <laughs> notes. Zero. Why is it zero? I, I, it's in. I can guarantee, Mandy. I will guarantee that it's on your notes. There you go. That's exactly it. Remember, a L of zero represents an s orbital, an L of one represents a p orbital, and so on and so forth. Okay. Well, if L is zero, what's my possible value of m sub L? Well, it's negative L through positive through zero to positive L. If L is zero, the only possible thing it can be is zero. And then what's M sub S? Positive one half. Why not? <coughs> because it is an arrow pointing up. Okay, next electron. I hate brown. Okay. Value of N. Two. Value of L, zero. M sub L, zero. M sub S, negative one half. See how that works out? Yes. I got you. I got you. I got you. Those are my possible values. Okay. Here in about forty-five seconds this is going to be explained, okay? But if L is zero, what's my only option for M sub L? Zero. It's okay. Give me about 45 seconds, all right? So anyway, I've got um, um, two different electrons, 
two sets of four quantum numbers, you can already see that they're slightly different from each other. In this case, the spin quantum number is different, right? Let's go to these. I want to do this one and this one next because that will possibly help with um, Allie's question. Okay, so what's the value of n here? Two. What's the value of L? One. Ooh. What's the value of M sub L, Allie? No, no, no. You don't have to answer. This is what I want you to pay attention to. And then here's the thing. Five other people have the same question, so you're helping a bunch of people out. Okay. Eight other people have the same question. Right, Emma? Okay. Uh, what are my po what's my value? What are my possible values for m sub l? Negative one, zero, positive one. Or in other words, p x, p y, p z. So this one would be negative one. What would be my value for um, um, m sub s? Plus one half. Okay, going over to this electron, what is my value for n? 2. How about L? 1. How about M sub L? 0. And how about M sub S? Positive 1 half. Now, this set, these two sets are different by one value, the spin value. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. But looking at the orange set and the green set, very similar to each other, but again, different by one value, right? Except that value is at the L position instead of the M sub S position. Where I'm going with this, every single electron location has its own address. Allie, is that any better? Yeah. Starting to get that way. Okay, well let's do that. Um, no, you, you guys don't have to go crazy here. But, how many d orbitals are there? Five. Okay, now, what is the value of L for a d orbital? Two. So we're talking L equals 2. What are my possible values for M sub L? Negative 2, negative 1, 0, positive 1, positive 2. It happened, didn't it? It's happening. It's happening. Okay. Let's go. Let's start doing some electron configurations. <sighs> there are three and a half types of electron configurations. What I mean by that, the, the second type of way we're going to represent where the electrons are in, the, in an atom there's a shorthand way of doing that also, okay? Uh, so I'll teach you, that's why I say three and a half. So anyway, that um, like test, quiz, AP exam, they'll ask you for a specific type of electron configuration. Okay? So when you hear the phrase orbital notation, this is the one that um, is the most detailed but is also the one that takes the longest. Okay? Tells you everything. 
So in orbital, no in orbital notation, we're looking at every single electron in all possible, in, in all the various positions that are available. Actually, I already gave you a hint. All those uh, uh, examples that I was doing with the arrows and the lines, that's orbital notation. Give me a second here. <coughs> Okay, so we're going to do one, two, three. We're going to do a few examples to start the ball rolling here, okay? And then I'm going to take those examples and have you guys try a few on your own. So the elements I want to do currently are lithium, sodium, and potassium. Go ahead and draw out all those little lines. Oops, I didn't I did not mean I'm gonna redo that because some of you guys, I know who you are now, are going to are going to read something into that that was not intended. Right, Kirsten? There we go. Did I do that better that time? Uh, they're supposed to be in a straight line. I don't know. I, I, I really don't know how many there are, but I know what I put up there is the correct number. We'll talk about how I know that later, because that's what you're going to use eventually, too. All right, so just for fun, um, Abby's going to say goodbye to Mom. Did you say goodbye to Mom? Did you tell her everything's cool? Okay, good. So, Abby, what's the first orbital? Which S? What's the first orbital that gets filled? Anyone? One S. What's the next orbital that gets filled? Two S. Okay. So, for lithium, how many electrons does lithium have? It's not that hard, people. You look at the periodic table, find the whole number that's written on the periodic table, and you find that it's three. That's three electrons. Now, according to Hund's rule, well, according to electron, we're going to put an electron here. Where's the next electron going to go? In the 1s with an arrow pointing down. And where's that third electron going to go? in a 2S with an arrow pointing up. Done. Your first electron configuration. Give yourselves a little round of applause. All right. Nice. Okay, next. Uh, let's name the orbitals here. Uh, Emma. What's the first orbital? Next one. Two S? Okay. Next. Go ahead. Okay, if the we're, we're the electrons are trying to get as close to the nucleus as possible. So what's the next orbital available? 2px, very good. What's the next orbital available? Everyone together now. And the next orbital available. And the next orbital, whoa, 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 whoa. 2pz, and then the next orbital. Excellent, all right, there we go. So let's put electrons in here. How many electrons does sodium have? Has 11, so where's the first one gonna go? 1s, arrow pointing up, next one. 1s, arrow pointing down. 
Next electron. 2s pointing up fourth. 2s down. Next electron. 2px up. Next electron. Yes. Next electron. Next electron. Yes. Next. And lastly, or not lastly, next. Pent ultimate. And then 3s. Boom. How are we doing? You should see the look on Addie's face right now. Do you? Excellent. We will attempt to prove that. Okay, so here we go. Um, Cameron, please provide us with the symbols for these orbitals for potassium. Rip them off. Go. No, you didn't forget. That was an opportunity to learn right there. You didn't know about it. What, Ryan? No, 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 you, you, you had a little questioning look on your face. Okay. Well, you, may get, you guys may remember the little diagram that I showed you ah, back on page... 107 or something like that that had the spacing of the energy levels relative to each other. And we observe that uh, as you go further and further from the nucleus, the distance between the energy levels got less and less and less. Does anyone remember that? Now what I'm showing you here is not showing that because we were using that for something else. It was just an analogy. Okay? Why is there less Space. And if you can under, if you can answer this question all on your own, that's phenomenal because it, it takes a little bit of thought for this, okay? It, a, a really full understanding of what's going on. But could anyone, would anyone like to offer a suggestion as to why the energy level dip, uh, uh, spacing is less and less the further you get from the nucleus? Go ahead. It is for reasons that I'm trying to draw from you right now. Okay, well then I kind of understand. I just don't know how to say Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, higher, higher. Uh, no, no, no. Yes. Okay, the question I'm asking, I, th I think you guys are kind of befuddled. You're trying to put it in terms of this. What I'm asking, if you can turn to page 107, is that right, 107? Yeah. If you could turn to page 107, just so you can look at this again. One second. You'll notice the further we get from the nucleus, the distance between the energy levels gets smaller and smaller. My question is, why is that true? I'm not asking yet why this is true. I'm asking why is the uh, uh, distance between energy levels less and less and less as you go further from the nucleus? Charcy, did you, you're, you're out now? <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to give you a hint here in a second. How many electrons are here? What's the maximum number? Two. Two. How about here? Eight. What about here? Eighteen. What about here? Thirty-two. Now, what has to counteract the addition of electrons? What else is being present? What's that? Protons in the nucleus. And the more protons there are in the nucleus, 
the greater the force of attraction for those electrons. And so that's pulling all those electrons, all those orbitals, closer and closer and closer to the nucleus. Is that making any a little bit of more sense now? So what starts happening, and I'm about to show this to you, is at some point in time, and you're kind of headed in the right direction, and maybe you, there starts to be an overlap of the orbitals. Because there's just so many protons pulling these electrons more and more closely. So there starts to be an overlap of the orbitals. We just encountered the first place where that overlap occurs. Okay? I'm going to show you a little diagram that will um, demonstrate this. I believe it's on page 113. I might be wrong. I lied. 111. There is the order that the electrons are actually um, arranged in an atom. If you look on the left-hand side of that di diagram, you'll start seeing how they have the various orbitals represented there. So it goes 1s, 2s. Well, that's a pretty big gap, right? Just like it was on page 107. And then between the twos, there's a little gap between before you get to the threes. But then you'll start noticing as you continue going up that column, you can see where the overlap occurs, right? Can you guys see that? And so we go 4s, then the 3d, then the 4p, and as you keep climbing up, we get quite a bit. We've got two orbitals overlapping each other, don't we? You have to know that order. Now, I saw a couple people pull out their phones so they could take a picture. I thought I saw Allie reaching for a pencil so she could write that down, but apparently she needed to comb her hair. Don't take a picture of that. Also, don't take out your pencil. So you need to know that order. You guys just kind of sat there like this. Did you memorize it already? Or, and here's where I gave you the clue yesterday, ahead of time. So I gave you guys advanced warning. Does anyone recall what orbital is being filled in these two columns? S. What about these six columns? P's. What about these ten columns here? D's, and what about these 14 columns here? S. Watch this. What do the, these values tell us? For the representative elements, they indicate the energy level. Watch this. Let's do lithium. Where are the first two electrons in lithium? In the 1s orbital. 1 Yes. Now, you guys remember that helium can be over here just as easily as it can over here. Two valence electrons, right? Second column. Where's the next electron for lithium? 2s. Let's look at sodium. Two electrons in the 1s. Two electrons in the 2s. Six electrons in all of the two P's, right? One electron in the three S. You see where I'm going with this? The periodic table is set up for the electron configurations. Now, before we go any further, I'm going to have Addy do the electron configuration for potassium, then we'll go back and do that again. So, Addy, here's the thing. Um, are you in robotics? No. Anybody in robotics? Okay. Um, if you ever take robotics, you need commands. You need to tell your robot some commands, okay? Um, computer program. Here are the only commands you have available to you. Up, down, over, and back. Those are your four commands. Up, down, over, and back. 
you're controlling me. Okay? I'm going to go to a position. I'll get you started. Okay? And then you're going to say the f one of four words. Up, down, over, back. That's it. Right? And how many electrons does uh, potassium have, everyone? 19. 19. So Ben, keep track for it because she's going to get lost. Okay? So when she gets 19 electrons, just go like this. <laughs> All right. Here we go. We'll try that one again. That's right. <laughs> at, at 25 years, that's been happening. So here we go. nicely done. It usually takes more than two attempts there. That, that was good. That was good. Okay, so now let's watch this. How many of you were, were playing along and kind of doing it yourself and felt pretty good about it? You guys knew what you're doing? Okay, so here we go. 19 electrons. Two in the 1S, two in the 2S. There were six in the 2Ps, right? There were two in the 3S. You look carefully, there are six in the 3P, right? And over here is the one in its 4S. Guess where the three Ds are? Well, remember, we already identified these as the th Ds, right? Where is the first place you're allowed to run into a D orbital? Third energy level. So, for the representative elements, these period numbers represent the energy level. But the Ds are always one less than the period number. Because remember, the first place you're allowed to run into a D is a third energy level. So these are three Ds. But then, what are we back to? Well, these are representative elements, so four P's. If you look in that little diagram on page 111, I believe you'll see that it goes 3S, 3P, 4S, 3D. Would you agree? And then back to the 4P. See where I'm going with that? So you don't even need that chart because you have this. Okay. A couple of other things I want to point out. What are valence electrons? Electrons in the outermost energy level. How many valence electrons does lithium have? One. How many valence electrons does sodium have? One. How many valence electrons does potassium have? One. One. Look at that. It's coming together, people. It's coming together. 